Good evening, everyone. My name is Evan Stankovic, adult programming librarian at the Northside Library, and on behalf of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, uh, we welcome you to this evening's virtual program, The Organ Thieves, the shocking story of the first heart transplant in the segregated South with Chip Jones. Tonight's program and all programs have, made have been made possible by the incredible and generous support of the Friends of the Library. If you know of anyone who could not attend this evening's program, no worries. Um, it is being recorded for inclusion on JMRL's YouTube channel. Barring any technical difficulties, we hope, hope to have that posted within the next couple of days. As a courtesy to this evening's presenter, we ask that all questions please be saved for the designated Q&A portions of the program. You can type questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the chat box, and we will attempt to address as many as time permits. Additionally, the closed caption transcript has been enabled for this evening's program. You can activate this feature by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen and enable subtitles. Please note, despite the prompt you might receive, you cannot save or download the transcript. Also, the transcription is by no means flawless. And with that said, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you this evening's presenter. Joining us from Richmond is Pulitzer Prize nominee, author, and investigative journalist, Chip Jones. After a trilogy of successful books addressing the United States Marines, the military branch in which his father served, Chip turned his attention to the subject that comprised his latest work, The Organ Thieves. Meticulously researched and unquestionably timely, this highly acclaimed work was described by Publishers Weekly as doggedly reported, a dramatic and fine-grained expose of the mistreatment of Black Americans by the country's white medical establishment. Additionally, this book was just recently named one of Virginia Living's favorite books of 2021. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, I believe. We are honored and delighted to have with us this evening Chip Jones to discuss this important and seminal work. And with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Chip Jones. Thanks, Evan. Thanks for that nice introduction and for having me here tonight. <clears throat> uh, I want to say hello to uh, many friends and family in and around Charlottesville, where we used to live, my wife, Debbie, and I. And I want to give a special hello to my father in law, George who has been a big supporter of this uh, tonight's event. So thank you for that, George, and all of your friends. You know, it, it's really always good to return to Charlottesville. And in fact, uh, I've just been asked to speak there sometime in mid-March uh, in person, we can hope, uh, at the Virginia Festival of the Book. Uh, the exact location to be determined but I thought I would mention uh, that it takes place during the week of March 16th to 20th. So uh, probably a lot of uh, you folks in Charlottesville have been to this event. I know I was there about a decade ago and it's a great, great event, but great collaboration with the university. So I look forward to that. And I just uh, mentioned that so you'll be on the lookout for more information. And one last detail uh, before I get into my presentation, and I do hope uh, your questions at, uh, at the end of the talk, Evans uh, has uh, kindly agreed to put a link in the chat box for anyone who wants to get the first edition paperback of the Organ Thieves at, at a reduced price from the hardcover. It's coming out uh, February 15th uh, from Simon & Schuster Gallery Books. Um, and it's now available for pre-order uh, just by using the link. And it, it is on most book websites, including Amazon, which uh, the is the link that he will uh, put up later in the, in the night. So with that said, uh, my presentation tonight is basically gonna have two parts. It's gonna be a brief introduction uh, to tell you uh, the roots of the organ thieves and how I came to explore uh, this strange mix of history and medicine and law and social justice among a number of issues uh, raised in the book. Um, and after that, I'll stop to see if we have any questions. After I, I have this uh, brief introduction, uh, Evan will kindly uh, let me know uh, any initial questions uh, you guys have, and I'm happy to try to answer them. Uh, and then after that, the second part of tonight's presentation, uh, with Evan's help again, we'll share some, uh, I hope you find an interesting slideshow uh, that uh, was prepared uh, by my friend Jody Costi, uh, who uh, kindly uh, allows me to use this for public events such as this. She's the archivist at VCU uh, Medical Center and uh, its library there. Um, and after that slideshow, uh, we'll have a second break. 
for any questions. So hopefully everyone will have time to uh, kind of um, digest uh, the thrust of what I'm saying, whether you've read the book or not, and some of the issues, um, many of them fairly difficult and disturbing that, that are raised by the organ thieves. So I'm gonna start uh, by asking you a few questions. Did you know that the system, the entire system of American medical education uh, stretching back to its earliest days uh, in, in the late 1700s at Harvard was actually built on the backs of black Americans whose bodies were stolen from graveyards. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've heard about the body snatchers or as our former governor, Doug Wilder described it to me, the quote, night doctors, as in what his grandmother told him when he was growing up in Richmond in the 1930s, you best stay away from MCV or you might get snatched up by the night doctors. And fast forwarding to more recent times, did you know that skeletal remains of these shadowy days at the Medical College of Virginia, just across the street from the state capitol, uh, were rediscovered in 1994? And this halted construction of the new medical building at today's modern day VCU School of Medicine. And adding to it, the long list of injustices perpetrated on Black Virginians. Did you know that the abandoned well where these discarded human remains were found just a few decades ago was quickly ordered by the college administration to be covered up, leaving many skeletons buried there still today near the very foundation of today's BCU School of Medicine in the Contos building. Finally, uh, to pose a more contemporary question, did you know that when Virginia celebrated its first human heart transplant in 1968, that the heart was taken to save the life of an ailing white businessman actually came from the body of a black factory worker shortly after the plug had been pulled on his life support. That man's name was Bruce Tucker and he'd been rushed into MCV's emergency room with a severe head injury, still alive and able to talk. And while his family was desperately searching to find him. Now, if you answered no to some of these questions I just posed, let me assure you, you're not alone. I would have given the same answers uh, not that long ago when I embarked on the research that led me to write The Organ Thieves. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that came about. It started about five years ago in 2016, while I was working on the staff of the Richmond Academy of Medicine. And I first heard about the 1968 heart transplant, MCV, this historic event, uh, the first in the state's history. And one of the few ever in, in the United States at that time. And until recently, and I mean, recently, past couple of years, this moment in time was part of Virginia medical lore and a kind of a greatest hit, if you will, of the 1960s. It featured, this moment in time, featured two legendary and much beloved doctors and medical school professors, Dr. David Hume and Dr. Richard Lauer. Now, Dr. Hume was an extroverted, hard charging kind of guy. He, he didn't mind stepping on some toes to get things done, accomplish his goals, including some pretty audacious medical experiments involving humans, chimpanzees, and at least one baboon. And then there was Dr. Lauer, the quieter, less prone uh, character in this, in this whole saga. He was less prone to temper tantrums or to stepping on other people's toes. But like David Hume, Richard Lauer was one of the most brilliant experimental surgeons of his day, which was why in 1965, Dr. Hume convinced him to move to Richmond from California, where Dr. Lauer had spent nearly a decade conducting cutting edge research at Stanford University. And Hume's recruitment of, of this esteemed heart surgeon was part of his wider effort to raise MCV's national stature at the time as an organ transplant center. Let me pause here for a moment 
to add some historical perspective. Some of you may be old enough, like me, to remember how back in the 1960s, heart surgeons often were famous, even on the level of movie stars and musicians and the first astronauts. So as I dug deeper into this intriguing globe-trotting tale, I discovered that Dr. Lauer's historic first in Virginia came only six months after the world was stunned to learn that the first ever successful human heart transplant operation had occurred in Cape Town, South Africa. Adding to my fascination as I dug into the story several years ago was the surgeon who made this medical breakthrough, Christian Barnard. He was the dashing charismatic doctor who became an overnight sensation even in apartheid South Africa. Now, as you know, back in Virginia, Richmond faced its own struggles with systemic racism, de facto segregation in schools, workplaces, and yes, hospitals. This was also true in and around Charlottesville, a legacy that I understand is still being addressed today. So during this time in the 1960s of social and political turmoil, Doctors Bernard, Lauer, and Hume were all the guys in their 30s and 40s, and they were at the peak of their professional powers as surgeons and as academic uh, experimental uh, scientists, really. And they accelerated the pace of research into the human heart as they were attempting a feat that was once considered impossible, that is, surgically removing a heart to save someone's life. And as I delved into this, I began to see the story as the medical equivalent to America's space race that was started by President John F. Kennedy in 1961, when he challenged Congress to send an American safely to the moon before the end of the decade. So, and, and I started envisioning my book as sort of like the right stuff by another Richmond writer, Tom Wolfe. And of course, the heart transplant race wasn't a competition between nations or ideologies as the space race was with the Soviet Union. Rather, it was a competition between ambitious and brilliant surgeons and their equally ambitious hospitals and universities, such as the Medical College of Virginia. And the University of Virginia School of Medicine also plays a role in my book. Like most human endeavors and competitions, it had its share of internal tensions, petty squabbles, professional jealousies, and perhaps most importantly, new and challenging questions about medical ethics. Questions that touched on a basic, still not, con not completely resolved uh, question even today, and that is what constitutes life and what constitutes death. All of these challenges and contradictions were embodied in the fraught life and times of South Africa's Christian Barnard. Remember, he was attempting to perform a medical miracle in a white dominated police state where blacks faced crushing poverty and political persecution. So this brings me to another thing that, this, that got me into this book. And I learned early on uh, in this story in terms of the Richmond connection at, at, the, at MCV and to Christian Barnard. About a year before becoming a medical rock star, Christian Barnard traveled to Richmond to study at MCV. Now, for a journalist and writer such as myself, nuggets like these confirm that you're on a, to a very big story. And the ambitious South African traveling to where he was a nobody, because he, he, in Richmond, Virginia, that, that told me something that I needed to learn more about. And in the end, as you'll see in the Organ Thieves, Barnard's three months in Virginia in the fall of 1966 would change the course of medical history. As he began to master Dr. Lauer's techniques of cooling organs for transplant, along with learning other secrets of the surgical trade in Richmond. Now, these stories alone could have provided enough fodder for, for a book, as you might, ima might imagine, but I found even more. And that is 
Soon after Dr. Lauer and Dr. Hume performed their much heralded heart transplant in May 1968, the family of the man who'd given up his heart, this black factory worker named Bruce Tucker, his family contacted a young criminal defense lawyer to serve as their advocate. And they wanted him to find out why Mr. Tucker's brother, who was a store owner named William, who worked about a mile away, why he had not been informed by MCV officials of Bruce's tragic fate. This would prove to be an even more poignant and tragic question when William Tucker, a shoe repairman, soon found that his own business card was in his brother's clothes all along while he was in the hospital. And they were turned over to him along with the body after he was pronounced dead. So his family's young lawyer was L. Douglas Wilder, who many of you know later became Virginia's first black governor and indeed the first black American to be elected governor in the United States. I met Governor Wilder in early 2017, in the early days of my research on this book. He was at his office uh, at the School of Government and Public Affairs that bears his name at VCU. And in our one hour long tape session, he recalled some often painful details of a story that he told me he really hadn't publicly discussed in about 45 years at the time. And among the most disturbing things he revealed to me was how MCV hospital officials weren't at all forthcoming with the Tucker family. That is, they didn't have the decency to inform William that his brother's heart had been taken out. And that painful task, as you'll see if you read the book, was left up to a local undertaker while he was preparing the body for, for burial. So I'll conclude my remarks with a quote, and then we'll get into the, the uh, slideshow after taking questions. And the, the quote, it comes from a favorite Catholic theologian of ours, Richard Rohr. And Richard Rohr says, you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. You cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. So if you're here for tonight's program, I'm fairly sure that you too are working on the importance of knowing and learning more about our shared history as we all continue to work on healing together. So I'm gonna stop there and invite uh, perhaps what might be a first round of questions. And then Evan, we can get into the, uh, the PowerPoint and the slideshow. Thank you, Chip. Um, any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box or the um, Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We'll give people a couple of moments. Don't see anything coming in yet, Chip. Um, do you want to well, jump into the presentation and we'll take another round of questions? After Absolutely. The All right, so. Mm -hmm. All right. So a lot of the research I did involved going to the archives of the uh, Library of Virginia, which if you haven't uh, delved into those yourselves, I highly recommend uh, they're so accessible for I think a $5 charge, you can get a online library card and, and just kind of rock and roll in, in the, uh, the world of legacy media. And uh, since the Times Dispatch was where I wound up working actually in the 90s and, and into the aughts, um, it was particularly interesting to me to spend a lot of time, and you can do the same from the comfort of your own home if you go to the Library of Virginia and it takes you right to their peri uh, periodicals. And so uh, some of these uh, headlines here, this first uh, are, are relevant to uh, before the heart transplant, there was a, a number of years of headlines. These are from 1962. You can see MCV staff has performed 10 transplants of kidneys. Uh, 
kidney transplants predict, predicted between unrelated persons. MCV rece receives grant of nearly 3 million for kidney research. And these are all from 1962, 1963. Um, and it shows a couple of things to me. One was MCV was getting great coverage uh, from the local paper, just like UVA hospital, I assume probably still gets fairly decent coverage from the Daily Progress. The uh, MCV got great coverage from its local paper, the Richmond Times Dispatch. And you'll note, um, you know, one of the dates here is October 10, 1963, which I was thinking is more than a month before President Kennedy was assassinated. Um, and it has the byline, um, you might notice, Beverly Orndorff. And, uh, and Beverly, who, who is a man, a nice guy, friend of mine, you'll meet Bev in my book. And uh, I met Bev, who was actually um, a colleague, as I said, much later than this uh, uh, at the Times Dispatch. He, was a, he, at that time, was a recent graduate of, of uh, UVA. He was a physics major, he told me. And he was one of the early, one of the first and early science reporters that actually were recruited uh, by American newspapers, including in Richmond, to improve the coverage of science uh, after the 1957 uh, launch by the Soviets of their Sputnik satellite. And everyone started uh, talking about the sky was falling. We needed more science and math. Sounds kind of familiar in, in some ways today. Um, and so after that, uh, political leaders started clamoring for more science education. And it's interesting to think about the things people fight about in today's schools uh, as well, isn't it? Next slide, please. So um, this, this is a slide that uh, is next to one of the uh, journal articles about reno uh, homo transplantation, um, and uh, that involves kidney transplants. And on the right is, uh, you'll see uh, Dr. Hume, I believe around 1963 with his staff. And uh, that was right around the time that he, had, he was put, really putting uh, MCV uh, on, on the national map with his kidney transplant research. Next. So this is, uh, this is an, a, a, an incredible group of, of people here from, from Stanford. Uh, in San Francisco, and it started out actually, the, the medical center was in downtown San Francisco in the late 50s before they moved it out to Palo Alto. Uh, and so this is a slide that shows uh, the research team uh, of Dr. Norman Shumway and Richard Lauer, who in their often quiet way, helped set the stage for the breakthroughs in heart transplantation uh, that led to the first uh, one that I mentioned in 1967, and their research dated back to the mid-50s when they met each other, and I, I detail that in the book. Uh, Dr. Shumway had a very modest operation in the basement of the Stanford Medical Center, and Dr. Shumway is the third from the left, um, and uh, Dr. Lauer, who's, who's a bit taller there, is, is uh, all the way on the far right. Next. So this is, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll read early in my book about uh, Lauer and Shumway's extensive use of dogs, as you'll see here, a dog in their research uh, in San Francisco uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And um, I actually had the pleasure of interviewing um, Ann Lauer, uh, Dr. Lauer's widow, who told me uh, some length about how they, uh, they spent a lot of time uh, trying to find stray dogs uh, uh, in, on the streets of San Francisco. Next. So this is, uh, this is from early 1967, this headline, dog ha heart transplant at MCV is successful. And again, you'll, you, you probably can't read it, but you'll see the byline there it's again is, is our friend Beverly Orndorff, who was following, following this unfolding his, historical story, you know, operation by operation. And this particular article uh, I noticed documents um, how a dog who'd received a transplanted heart had actually lived for a year and managed to give birth to a litter of six puppies. And uh, he reported, uh, the exact quote is, he wrote, this event, 
is tied in with a larger lesson being learned by MCV scientists, namely heart transplants are moving from the realm of possibility to probability, end quote. And Bev would prove exactly right. Very, that was January, 1967. Uh, he, was, uh, he was about 11 months uh, away from it. Next, please. Uh, so this is Dr. Lauer on the left with his research team uh, conducting some type of uh, operation. I, I never had any exact details on this photo, but I think it's, uh, it's probably one of the dogs uh, that he used in Richmond. And um, as I thought about this, it occurred to me, some of you may have heard the news from uh, the Maryland School of Medicine and uh, University of Maryland this week had performed the first successful transplant of a genetically modified pig's heart to save a man's life. Now, I'm no expert in this latter-day surgery, especially when it comes to genetically altered heart, but it did bring to mind, uh, to me, a lot of the research that I explore in the organ thieves, um, including in early attempts to use hearts and livers from a variety of animals, including uh, the one I alluded to earlier, a particularly colorful case involving a baboon. Next, please. Yeah, and this is uh, this is right along the lines of this another uh, it's another one of the MCV animal uh, animal operations. Next. So here we have on the left uh, the. Uh, uh, guy who became uh, a true celebrity, uh, especially for a, for a physician uh, in late 67 and early 68, Christian Barnard. And uh, he had, uh, right after he performed, this is the next day, I believe, it's, it's December 4th, 1967, is the dateline on the Richmond Times-Dispatch. And uh, you'll see on the left with a, a red box around it, uh, surgery team chief worked at MCV in 66. And this, this uh, became a source of acute professional jealousy and some resentment for Hume uh, in, in, in regard to the fact that they got very little uh, attention in the uh, national or international news reports for the immense contributions they had made in, in giving uh, Barnard the ideas uh, in, in how they conducted uh, heart surgery and also in particular using uh, the deep cold uh, techniques that Dr. Lauren Shumway had perfected at Stanford in order to give the surgeons time to keep the organ viable uh, for transplantation. That was a major breakthrough, but it took years for them to perfect that. And um, that, particular, um, that particular headline really stood out to me because I could only imagine not only with the doctors, but the whole surgery department there at MCV, uh, and I was told by others was, was, was fuming. Uh, next. So this is Dr. Lauer uh, on the left and on the right is, uh, what was called uh, MCV Hospital at the time. It's at 12th and Broad. Uh, if you're ever visiting Richmond, you can easily um, park in the main parking deck there. Parking is terrible, as anyone will tell you, around the hospital, as it is around most hospitals. Uh, but it's fairly affordable, and you can walk over toward the, uh, this building. It's right, actually right across the street from, from Capitol Square. Um, and this is where um, you will see a lot of things happen in the organ thieves. Um, on the right side at the bottom is where the uh, ambulance uh, rushed in on the evening of May 24th, 1968, uh, right, right down the hill from um, Church Hill where Bruce Tucker uh, suffered a head injury sitting around just having an uh, after work drink with some friends behind an SO station and he fell off a low wall and just hit his head uh, and uh, as I said before, he was still talking as he entered the hospital. Um, and 
um, within, within um, in less than 24 hours, um, his, uh, his uh, heart and not only that, uh, but his, both his kidneys were taken without, of course, his consent, because he was unconscious, but without his family's knowledge. Um, you'll see in the book, I go into some detail about what the hospital said at the time and what the, the surgery department said they tried to do to find uh, the family. And, um, but as I said earlier, as I alluded to, this card that was in his uh, pants all along would have led uh, the uh, hospital to find William Tucker who worked right down the hill in what, what we call Shaco Bottom uh, here in Richmond um, at, his, at his shoe repair shop. Um, so the next day, uh, le uh, less than 24 hours after uh, Bruce Tucker was rushed into the emergency room there, uh, his, his heart was still beating when they made the decision to uh, unplug him from life support um, after he'd, they'd gotten uh, one um, EEG from, from uh, a, uh, one of their specialists there uh, who said that he basically was brain dead. And we'll get into more about that later. Uh, that heart was implanted into the chest of a white, uh, Mr. Tucker's heart was implanted into the chest of a white businessman uh, from Orange, Virginia, uh, Joseph Klatt. Um, he had suffered chronic heart disease his whole life, and he was, he was the same age, strangely, as Bruce Tucker. He was 54, um, and he'd been treated at UVA Hospital before he was transferred to MCV in sort of a last-ditch attempt uh, to, to, uh, to, after he agreed with his wife to him being considered uh, for a very experimental type of operation, meaning a heart transplant. Next. So this is the front page, Sunday, May 25th, excuse me, May 26th, 1968, the next day after the heart transplant. And you'll see a little flat kind of headline there, heart transplant operation performed here by MCV. Uh, I get into the book a little bit of the reasoning but why there was no byline. I won't go into it here, but they, the paper had gotten beat by the Associated Press on the story. Uh, somebody up in Orange, Virginia, uh, managed, uh, tip, tipped off the Associated Press and uh, they actually beat the, the TD on that story. Um, but uh, it was the first, uh, it was the first notice that uh, the more than 200,000 readers, you can see up at the top how, how big newspaper circulation was then compared to today, uh, that the, the uh, Capital City newspaper was letting everybody know that there was this historic heart transplant at, at MCV. Next. So um, this, is, uh, this is a picture of uh, the recipient, Mr. Klett, Joseph Klett, a family photo that I think they must have given the paper. Um, and you'll see on the left uh, of the slide, some historical context, which points out that um, it was the 16th heart transplant in the world, the ninth in the United States, and as I said before, the first in Virginia. Next. Here's our friend again, uh, Bev Orndorff, as, as a younger man, uh, pulling some copy off of one of those good old uh, teletype machines. It used to go clickety-clack in newsrooms. Um, and he played a key role in, in breaking down the wall of silence that MCV erected in 1968 after the operation. Um, Bev's a real thoughtful, you know, cerebral is a word that comes to mind right now, uh, gentleman, uh, you know, a guy from the Valley of Virginia, went to UVA. Um, so hardly, you know, sort of a Bob Woodward or, or more aggressive type personality, but very good reporter. And he knew exactly, um, the uh, meaning of what had just happened. And he, he, he'd long had a good relationship with Dr. Hume and Lauer and others at MCV. But after he, uh, after he uh, figured out, he publicized Bruce Tucker's name uh, and he put a human face on the story. After that, um, he was pretty much ostracized by, by the doctors and by the surgery department for the next year or so. And it really, 
you know, as best as I could determine, and I interviewed Bev about this recently, I mean, for the book, uh, he just, he just, he, they were just angry that he had taken away the narrative of their story, which basically left out the name of the, the heart donor. Next. So here is um, the first headline about Bruce Tucker. That was a couple of days later. And uh, it doesn't have Bev's uh, byline, but I know he wrote this story. Uh, and it has the only photo um, extant that I could find of Bruce Tucker from the Times Dispatch. They're kind enough to let me reprint it in my book. Um, you'll see it notes that he was a native of Dinwiddie County, which uh, if you uh, aren't familiar with Central Virginia, it's, it's a rural area that's southwest of Petersburg. It's right off of 95 uh, and uh, right, right near uh, uh, for Virginia 40 at Waverly, go in the other direction. Uh, it's not far from, from the interstate. And this article ran the morning after um, Orndorff was, was told by the newspaper's obituary desk that they'd gotten a call from the funeral home director down in Stony Creek, Virginia, which is in Dinwiddie, and that was handling Tucker's funeral. And basically, Mac Jones, the owner of Jones Funeral Home said, hey, uh, by the way, uh, this, this Obed is for that guy who made history. And he was pretty proud of it. So you'll note, like many initial news reports, especially today in our 24 seven news cycle, this article included an error you can see on the top left of the insert, it says 53 year old man. And uh, Tucker was actually uh, 54 uh, at, the, at his time of death. Next. This is St. Philip Hospital on the left, which was racially segregated in the mid 1960s. And you can see inside uh, to of that hospital. And it was, um, as it transitioned from being uh, a segregated hospital into, at first it still had a, mostly black patients. Um, it was the place that was, that was used by Dr. Hume and Lauer as a way to keep uh, their research away from basically the, the more white majority wards of Medical College of Virginia. Um, a hospital administrator kind of worked that out with, with Hume when he heard about some particularly sort of zany operation that, that Hume was attempting. And St. Philip is also, if you read the book, you'll see this is where Bruce Tucker's brother, William, got the tragic news that his, his brother was dead. And at the time, the hospital officials did not tell him the most shocking part of the news, which was that his heart and kidneys had been cut out without the family's consent or knowledge while Bruce lay unconscious. Next. So, it didn't take long for uh, William Tucker to figure out something was rotten in the state of Virginia. Here are two early news reports from late May, 1968. And you'll note they, they offer differing perspectives of the white owned Richmond Times Dispatch on the left with his headline, questions arise on heart donor and on the right, a more skeptical headline in the black owned Richmond Afro-American says, say heart was snatched for Virginia transplant. You can see the difference in tone. Questions arise, heart was snatched. Um, on what the more establishment press considered simply an important historic first, a perspective that I first encountered uh, in 2017 still. Uh, just a few years back when I first started doing my research. Next. So this led to a civil lawsuit filed in Richmond Circuit Court in 1971. And my book details the experiences uh, and struggles of the, the family attorney, L. Douglas Wilder. Um, Mr. Wilder at the time was in his late 30s. He was a well known in the community, especially in the black community as a criminal defense lawyer. 
and he would spend four years uh, preparing for and trying the civil case. Uh, I barely made the filing deadline in 1971 because he had to, he had so much other legal work to do as a criminal attorney. And one of the things you'll see in my book is um, interviews with uh, various people who were on the attorney general's staff then when they were very young who explained to me um, how even though Wilder was a great courtroom attorney, he was pretty much outgunned by the resources of the state of Virginia. And, and, and Mr. Wilder pretty much said the same thing uh, to me, that the, uh, the state was not going to allow um, um, a Black family with a Black lawyer to sort of question this historic uh, event that had been touted at the one of the you know biggest medical centers uh, in Virginia. And it was like the, the phrase that came to my mind was like with the banking industry, MCV was too big to fail. Now Wilder, as you may know, um, uh, you know, as I said, he later became he actually entered the state Senate uh, during during this time he was research he was doing the the uh, civil case research. And uh, his his interview with me gave me a lot of um, sort of crumbs along the research trail that I had to follow. Um, you'll say you, you'll see the heart team sued for one million, um, and it, it quotes one of the brothers um, saying that uh, it terminated um, his brother's life. I believe that was William saying that. And then you'll see another uh, headline on the left that $1 million suit um, was, was filed. You'll, you'll see also in the book how that dollar amount was pared down because of various uh, rulings, pre-trial rulings by the judge uh, that when it finally came to trial, it, it had gotten pared down to about a $100,000 uh, civil suit. Next. So this is, um, again, if you ever visit uh, Richmond or if you've been here before, you might recognize this. This is, this is the old city hall in downtown Richmond. It stands today still on the Capitol grounds um, and you can walk in. Um, and, and, and also many of the sites uh, in the story of the Oregon Thieves uh, can, be, uh, can be found on two, two great maps that, that an artist prepared for me, uh, uh, Christopher Hibben. And, uh, but this building uh, with its spires and windows, they're it's known as the Gothic revival style of architecture. Uh, this is where the Wilder Tucker family lawsuit was finally heard by a jury, a seven man all white jury in May, 1972, um, four years, almost to the day after the heart transplant operation. And um, this historic building, which is now a national historical landmark, it provided a very dramatic backdrop for the David Goliath versus Goliath legal confrontation as Doug Wilder fought, fought very, very hard to get some financial compensation for the Tucker family for its, for its loss. Next. So this is a, this is a very dapper looking, um, Doug Wilder, um, then a state, as it says, state Senator L. Douglas Wilder. Um, when he was uh, in, this, in the early 70s, right around the time he was representing the family. And as you'll read in my book, um, Mr. Wilder had the audacity to challenge the status quo in the General Assembly from, as, as the only black senator, I believe it, at that time. Uh, he started with a crusade that took him many years to accomplish. Uh, that is, to get rid of the racist state song, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. Next. So this is, uh, as it says, the attorney for the physicians, Jack Russell. The, I always think the aptly named Jack Russell. He's a great attorney. I was privileged to get to uh, interview his son, uh, John, who was practicing law here in Richmond and gave me a lot of great background that I used uh, in the book. Um, he represented, doc, he actually represented the two surgeons, Lauer and Hume, well, while the attorney general's office represented MCV. Um, and that was because uh, they had me medical ma malpractice um, 
uh, coverage, and he was the attorney for the St. Paul uh, Insurance Company. And Russell was, what I found interesting, was one of the first specialists in the, in the nation in what was then a very new field of, uh, of law, um, medical malpractice. And he would go on, he's, he sort of had it both ways. He used MCV doctors to testify as his, um, you know, as his expert witnesses during various trials, but he also wound up becoming a lecturer at MCV and he tried to help physicians and medical students learn how to avoid getting sued in the first place. Next. So this is uh, Judge uh, Christian Compton, the Honorable Christian Compton, and he was the Richmond Circuit Court judge who presided in the 1972 case of Tucker versus MCV. And he struggled in, during the course of the, of the trial and bef even before in some of his pretrial rulings, but definitely during the two week trial, he struggled to balance the tenets of Virginia law as it should be applied in the case with a new field of research that argued for a more sort of progressive concept of brain death. Um, and this later concept was used by the defense, by Jack Russell, who we just met, and by uh, his uh, co-litigators co for the Attorney General's office. The defense used the concept of brain death um, as they brought in expert witnesses from around the country, including some from the University of Virginia. And I found, um, I found Judge Compton's handwritten trial notes in the archives of his alma mater, uh, the William Washington and Lee, uh, Washington Lee uh, University Law School. Um, and they were fascinating. And I, uh, because you'll, you'll learn in the uh, book, the trial transcript never uh, did, did not survive. There's a lot of sort of interesting uh, theories about that that I won't go into here, but uh, both sides thought something was wrong with it. Uh, but it turned out that because the, the, uh, the uh, Tucker family couldn't afford uh, to file an appeal, uh, the, the transcript was destroyed after 10 years, which is what they, what they do in Richmond Circuit Court, I think even today, but certainly back then. But Judge Compton, a very distinguished jurist, he, he later went on to become a frequent speaker about brain death issues around the country. And he also was elevated to the uh, Virginia State Supreme Court. Next. So this quote um, I'll read came from an oral history that Dr. Lauer gave in 2002, which I, I use in my book. He gave two oral histories, I believe, to the medical college. And here's what he said. The first difficulty occurred, I think, on the first day when someone mentioned the word malpractice and the judge, he sort of said, pulled it right there. He said, this is not a case of malpractice. This is a case of wrongful death. And so it gave us all a little pause because first of all, I wasn't insured against, you know, wrongful death. I mean, we we're talking about like murder. Well, this quote reflects his feeling despite the reassurances of his own defense team that this was a civil lawsuit not a criminal lawsuit that might have wound him up in prison. It was a wrongful death suit. In fact, it was the first wrongful death uh, civil suit about a heart transplant ever filed in the United States. And it, and it had the impact of chilling the, the number of heart transplants that happened before the case went to trial. Um, but the, the, I found his, his Dr. Lauer, really brilliant guy, and, but in my interviews with various people, including his wife, Anne, I could never find the exact reason why he held on to this misconception about the fact that he might go to, to jail or prison for this. Um, he was a sensitive and thoughtful man. And Dr. Lauer took the lawsuit and trial, I think, much more to heart than his colleague, David Hume, who just sort of basked in the limelight of the media attention. Next. These are two uh, headlines from articles about the outcome of the case, which Wilder and 
Tucker family lost, as I said, it had been whittled down about $100,000. They never did get a penny, in case you're wondering. They still haven't from anyone. Uh, the article notes that Virginia rules that death occurs when brain dies. Uh, that's on the right side. And actually, this was a stretch as, as I reread that th this week. The jury simply reached a verdict that it exonerated that uh, the doctor is in hospital for what was considered wrongful death under Virginia law. They, and it didn't award any money uh, to the family for its loss, but uh, it didn't really rule that death occurs. Only the, 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 the General Assembly could do that and, with, by law. And so the ruling did prompt the, soon after, within six months, uh, in 1973, the General Assembly passed a law, it's only the second in the nation at the time, to, that they, doctors could, and hospitals could consider a patient brain dead under certain circumstances. Uh, in effect, in their view, bringing uh, the law uh, up, to, up, up to date. And it's worth noting that Doug Wilder himself, who was still in the state Senate, helped write that law. And indeed, he told me that he considered this the, the, the only positive outcome of the Tucker case, sort of his legacy. And um, I, I, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, you'll note that the article on the left says, heart snatch case doctors win, but victim's brother to appeal. Well, in the end, Appeal was never filed, Governor Wilder told me, because the Tuckers simply couldn't afford it. They didn't, they didn't have the deep pockets to do that. Next. Now in this final slide, and I hope if you have any questions, um, you'll start sending them in as we, as we, uh, as we come to a close. Uh, in this final slide, uh, you'll see on the left, the only memorial plaque about these events that I know of on the VCU Health Campus. And it's right on in front of that old MCV hospital I, I told you about. It's now called West Hospital, it's at 12th and Broad. You can actually pull right in uh, off the street and, and, and just look at this. It says birthplace of cardiac Transpl transplantation. And it, the plaque notes that Lauer and Hume and other aspects of transplantation and, at the university, but it makes no mention either of Bruce Tucker, um, the donor, you know, against his will donor, but maybe, but the donor, and the man who received his heart, Joseph Klett, who died eight days later uh, of complications uh, from uh, the transplant. So on the right, you'll see an editor's note on an online article that appeared about a year and a half ago after VCU uh, officials and uh, medicine, School of Medicine got wind of the pending publication of my book. And to date, that's the only thing I know of that's been official, done officially as a result of my book, as far as the Tucker family goes, including no formal apology, despite my best efforts. Um, I do hope that VCU is, is going to have some study of my book and its curricula this year. Um, so you can be on the lookout for that whenever it's announced. And there are some other efforts that the university has made to sort of, you know, come to a reckoning about it, the mistakes of the past. So that's the end of my slideshow. And I thank you very much, uh, Evan, uh, for running it. And also, and for you, the audience, for, for taking time to, to listen and to try to learn about this story in my book. Um, I appreciate uh, him posting a link if you wish to pre-order uh, the paperback in the chat room. Um, it's set for release mid-February, but you can order it right away. Um, and it's also available uh, in hardback at various bookstores, including Barnes and Noble, and hopefully at your local independent booksellers who I always try to encourage and use. So thank you so much for your attention. And maybe we do have a few questions. We do have a few questions, Chip. I'm gonna try to go through the order in which they came in. So awesome. I believe one of the earliest ones was, do you see similarities to what happened to Henrietta Lacks in Tuskegee without her family's knowledge? Definitely, that's a great question. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the story of Henrietta Lacks and by Roberta Skloot uh, and 
taking her, uh, her cervical cancer cells without her family's knowledge and using them for research and, and, and with no compensation, no awareness either. Yes, definitely. Um, and the, um, the, uh, the lack of, um, the lack of uh, transparency and honesty with, with the people who are in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment for I think about 50 years um, is also one of the shameful episodes uh, of American medicine. Um, and um, I tried uh, to incorporate as much as I could about those events as I, as I could in, into my book. So good question. Another question here. Are you familiar with the work of Harriet Washington uh, called Medical Apartheid? Yes, I, I did see that book and included it in, in, my, uh, in my bibliography. I didn't quote it very much because I went in sort of a different direction, but I am familiar with that. Were there any laws or regulations back then requiring consent for surgeries, or did they just ignore those regulations? Well, my, my best... Uh, information about not only the MCV, but around the country is that at that time that um, there, was, there was none of the rules in place, which you'd have now for uh, academic research. Uh, you have institutional boards. Uh, now on, on the sort of you know, uh, other side of healthcare, you had no HIPAA, so you had no patient rights uh, as part of federal law. Um, and so um, the answer is basically uh, that, that the surgeons uh, did, did not have to get their uh, prior consent for a number of things, like to, to ask someone if they wanted to be part of a, a kidney experiment uh, happened all the time. And you'll read in my book, you know, some firsthand accounts of a doctor I, I interviewed uh, who felt um, very queasy about what he saw as a medical resident. Uh, and he, um, he said he felt it violated the Nur Nuremberg, uh, the ethics after Nuremberg and Nazi Germany. Um, so there are a lot of, as, as the earlier questioner alluded to about Tuskegee, there's also a lot of, and, and Harry, Henrietta Lacks, there's also a lot of uh, historical parallels there to, um, to, to, the, to the really awful and uh, uh, unethical practices of Nazi Germany. Thank you, Chip. Um, another question here. Do you see any connections between Virginia's connection to eugenic science and the willingness to use an organ from a person of color without getting permission? I mean, that's, that's, yes, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the whole, uh, and there's so much history there. I, I the, Dr. Pleck, Walter Plecker, who ran the who ran the whatever it was called the bureau in Richmond that you know basically ran you know labeled people of each race and making race part of er everything uh, on your whether it's your birth certificate or anything from the 1920s on and then the eugenics were were big obviously uh, be even before World War II um, and uh, very commonplace and and that's part of the reckoning I think that's going on. At probably at UVA, I was soon School of Medicine as well as MCV and around around um, Virginia. Um, I I remember when I was at the Roanoke Times, a super reporter named Mary Bishop did really great research back in the '80s about Lynchburg and the training center and how um, people that were thrown off of their land not not far from not far from. Uh, Charlottesville to build the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, Senator Byrd wanted that parkway built in the Shenandoah National Park. There's a lot of shameful history there. And uh, uh, I know that two really great uh, folklore professors, uh, Chuck and Nan Perdue, I got to interview them when I was in Charlottesville and they just blew my mind with their research showing how the government had just taken away these people's land and labeled them as, as you know, deficient and you know, mentally deficient, all these terms they used uh, and their work, this, and to me, this is the importance of, of academia and, and, and a primary research um, is they show that these people had churches, they had, they found deeds, they had families. And a lot of those families still probably live up and down the Blue Ridge uh, near, the, near that land where 
It's very similar to, to how Native Americans were treated. Thank you, Chip. Um, so there's a number of questions coming in here. I'm going to try to lump one of these questions into one larger question. Um, mm -hmm. So somebody is thanking you for your research and courage to write the book. Um, do you think this is the reason the university changed the name of the medical school? That's the first question. Um, and then second, and this question is coming a lot, um, are you in touch with any living relatives of uh, Mr. Tucker? And huh? do you know how the family is processing this injustice? Mm, that's a really good question. Well, first, I don't know of any connection between changing the name from MCV to VC, the Virginia Commonwealth University um, I think the, that I do recall that back in the 90s, the university administration was trying to, you know, rebrand and have that one brand, you know, and this is the way it is, don't, don't we know it at all the universities, you know, the uh, <clears throat> people who are the fundraisers wind up uh, calling the shots. So they didn't want to have two separate brands. And I know a lot of the older doctors who graduated from MCV hated that. There's probably still a fair number around who might agree with that. So, but I don't know of a connection like to, to get away from that shameful past, but that's a very astute question. Um, now about the family, you'll see if you read my book, uh, I visited, I, I found, I felt compelled to find uh, his son, Abraham Tucker. Uh, and I won't go down in the weeds because you can read it in the book, but basically I, I felt like I, I needed to get in touch with him and ask him in person. I'd written him a number of times for a year and I finally did find him and um, he, he, he was polite to me, but he really didn't want to do an interview at that point. Um, so I did get in touch with, um, and I haven't talked to her in a number of months because my attitude has been, I'm not trying to re-traumatize uh, the Tucker family, but his, his cousin Shirley, uh, uh, um, uh, who actually is the estate owner there of the property, uh, I've been in touch with her and, um, she, you know, again, these are difficult issues and I, I try to get some other family members and, you know, it, I, they didn't want, I, I didn't want to be in a position where I was um, making them go through another, you know, mem bad memories of this or what they call in the medical school historical trauma. But I will say on the positive side that the last time I did hear from Shirley uh, Tucker Holmes, uh, who's retired in Florida now, that she did say, that Abram had read the book and that he he finally you know found it to have some kind of healing uh, for him. Now, how far that goes, I can't say. And I I would not you know I would just humbly say you know at this point it, uh, you know I'm I, I let him have his privacy. Um, he knows um, that the door is open as far as I, I've tried to help him get in touch with various people to to see what he wants to do. And I don't know if. BCU has ever uh, had a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, I have a feeling they haven't, uh, but I tried to work uh, diligently uh, to make that possible. Thank you, Chip. Did you have time for another question or two or? Oh, sure. Okay. Whatever you, whatever you guys want. I apologize beforehand. I don't think we're gonna get to everyone's question here. So um, um, let me see here. Uh, have you been asked to speak to any medical colleges about your book? I know you mentioned VCU. Um, yeah. and, and what is the general feedback been um, from this book? Mm, well, I do, uh, I do the, the, there's so much feedback. It's, it's kind of hard to generalize. I'll say that up front. Generally, I mean, positive in, in the sense that, um, first of all, uh, when we launched the book in Richmond and people came on the street there, is there is right after the protests and there were a lot of boards up down in Carytown. So it's kind of a street, you know, book opening. And I talked to a lot of people, uh, especially, you know, blown away by a lot of black readers who, who said they, they really uh, wanted to read it. And uh, some, some who got back to me that helped them to answer questions in their own lives. For example, why their family had avoided MCV in the 50s. One, one friend of mine, uh, a former Marine told me that, and it really helped him kind of put some pieces of the puzzle together. Um, uh, now, as far as talking to, um, to medical students, I, I think that's gonna happen. Uh, I've talked to a friend of mine named Mark Ryan who teaches population health, a doctor at BC School of Medicine. And he has indicated, you know, that uh, this year, you know, when COVID kind of settles back as we all hope it will, um, that I would get in touch with uh, and spend some time with some of his students. I've heard from some other, 
I heard from a chaplain uh, at, at VCU, which was very touching that she wanted me to get together with some of the hospital chaplains. Um, you can go to my website, uh, chipjonesbooks.com, and you'll see an interview on NBC in Chicago uh, that did a really good series on Northwestern's transplantation program uh, and focused on, there's only like, I'm gonna approximately 12 uh, doctors in the United States, heart transplant doctors, I believe it's heart transplant, only 12 doctors in the United States are black. And one of them is at Northwestern. So, so this news report used that book to kind of help amplify some of these uh, issues of historical uh, racism. So the general, you know, it all depends on the readers. I, I've known a few uh, older doctors who knew these doctors who weren't that thrilled with the book. I mean, just to be honest, uh, but in general, I think that I think the uh, responses, especially by by uh, black readers uh, who have talked to me, you know, through interviews, sometimes media interviews. Um, I've, I've been, you know, as, as a guy, you know, grew up with white privilege and had great medical care, you know, very humbled by, by how much I have I have learned from others uh, since this book was published. And so I always say I've never had a book. It has kind of a, a, you know, continuing life. It continues to to inspire uh, a lot of positive discussions, and 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 I hope has a, even some positive outcomes. That's fantastic. Thank you, Chip. Well, I think we've just about run out of time for questions, but I would like to end on a comment that we just received a few moments ago. Um, it says, "Thank you for mentioning Father Rohr's comment that we cannot heal from the past until we confront it. I believe America must do that very thing to heal." I look forward to reading your book. So thank I think you. that's a great note to end on. Awesome. And with that said, I want to thank you very much, Chip, for being here with us. Um, fantastic lecture, uh, fantastic discussion. Um, and I want to thank everybody who joined us this evening. And again, we will have a recording of this on the JMRL YouTube channel, hopefully in the next day or two. So please keep an eye out for that and please share that with anyone. All right. With that said, thank you all very much and have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you.